Okay. Um, still no sound or better? Okay, perfect. I don't know why it didn't work. Um, glad it works now. So, um, cool. I, uh, I guess let's start. Um, I think everyone who wanted to join probably joined. So, um, let me kind of just give a heads up what I want to talk about. Um, and then I, I can get to the demo part. So, um, uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, this, like I said a few times, uh, this is the first time I'm streaming about this game. I just wanted to have like small, um, kind of like discussion or where I'm gonna be talking about the game, uh, explaining what's the, what are the next steps, what are the next plans. Um, maybe go through the setup for how the game is built. Um, uh, this stream is intended to be like for a very small audience. I will probably publish it somewhere, but uh, haven't decided yet. And uh, the way this is gonna work, um, let me demo the game first. Let me tell you where, what's the current status, what you can do. Uh, maybe I will then answer a few questions. And after that, I wanna go through uh, the workflow, like the code, maybe some tools I'm using, um, and then maybe also explain some uh, things that how they implement in the game. So let's start with, uh, and yes, so if you if you have questions, please post them in this chat or in stream discussions. I will be monitoring them from uh, periodically. Um, also, I guess since uh, I can't run NVIDIA Insight, something is always broken in the last moment. Let me just really quickly recompile this with, with FMOD and uh, uh, so that you will hear sound from the game. Although the sound is not really uh, amazing, it's still uh, most like a placeholders. So um, here's the game. Um, this is the latest revision. It's not like something I specifically made for demo. So um, the idea of the game is, um, oops, the idea of the game is um, it's kind of like a survival base building um, game similar to games like Walheim um, or Terraria, Green World, where you have a character, you can explore the map, you can uh, collect different resources, fight with mon monsters, um, kind of like improve your skills, um, but you, can, you also have um, your colony that you can build and you have different uh, NPCs or characters who live in your colony. Um, and during the day, your kind of goal is to expand the colony, harvest resources. Uh, then during the night, you come back to your colony, you protect it from uh, the wave of monsters. And uh, then you go to the next day and you repeat the cycle, you kind of expand again. At some point when you have enough uh, resources and um, people in a colony, you can raid uh, like places where monsters are coming from uh, and defeat bosses. And once you defeat bosses, uh, you kind of like, um, how you say it, um, you protected the island and you can sail to the next island and do the same thing. Um, in the final version, I want to try to have um, have this game open world, so there will be like infinite or almost infinite map. Right now it's limited to one chunk. Um, yeah, so that's kind of like the, the main idea of the game. So what you have right now, um, we have uh, terrain. It's uh, auto-generated from uh, various like uh, procedure, various using various algorithms for procedural generation. Mostly pretty simple. It's um, mainly just uh, different noises that we combine, and based on that, we generate a high altitude map. Based on altitude map, we we figure out what's the uh, what each of these locations are. Like, is it the forest? Is it a uh, lake or a mountain? And then there is like a simple, a similar algorithm for each of the types of uh, locations to populate it with different stuff like 
uh, for mountains we generate all this like rocks and caves for forests we place uh, trees and uh, other things uh, and stuff like that and then we also try to populate it with um, creatures for now the creatures don't have uh, AI it's basically turned off uh, the only thing they do they uh, have like a collision avoidance like if I close to if I get too close to uh, my villagers they will try to kind of like stay um, keep some distance so that we don't collide into each other double check if okay cool no questions so far other than terrain uh, we have um, next layer is kind of like structures structures can be multiple types uh, I, I guess just two types first one is this grid structures they have like a regular regular size and the second type is uh, I would say um, freeform structures I don't really have a special name for them I, I just call them structures so it's everything else like all this like vegetation trees rocks uh, anything you build, um, all this uh, animated things, um, and other thing that works is um, uh, creatures. So creatures can be also multiple times, multiple types. There are um, there are some um, animals um, like these foxes and rabbits and. Um, wolves and others and there are monsters um, there's like not huge difference between them monsters are just kind of like aggressive and they participate in this waves every night but in animals they they usually peaceful un un until you do something with them um, and the third type of um, creatures is um, characters characters are could be either your, your character which is like player or um, or uh, NPCs and characters they have some AI they have different uh, behaviors they have uh, inventory um, and stuff like that and the last part that also kind of implemented is items um, items pretty simple there they have like two forms one is the loot like the things you see on the map um, <coughs> sorry if you hear my voice and you pick it, you can pick it up. Oops, um, I guess I don't have any stuff on me. And um, the second form is like when you pick something up, it goes into your inventory and you can either see it on the character or use it. Um, so these are four types of uh, stuff that's currently implemented. Um, and th there is like some interaction that already works. So for example, you can, um, destroy things once you destroy it there's like some visual effect that you can see and there, there are like items that spawned oops and it, and it crashed um and um this is how you can you know collect um resources or clear up uh some space thank you uh or clear up some space for for your colony um you can also kill um you know other creatures and they will play animation they will also spawn some uh some stuff um and um uh, other thing you can like the way you can interact is you can build um you can build stuff so and like i said there are two types of uh things you can build it's either this like a regular grid structures and you can build like walls and um in the future floors and stuff like that or you can also place uh, objects like at um at any location isn't which is not snapped to a grid so you can put like decorations or some um some furniture and um this is something I currently want to expand in the, in the next um, build. I just want to build, make a lot of assets for, um, for you know, construction part of the game, for the base building part of the game. Um, the last part I actually didn't talk about is also day and night cycle. So, which is probably why a lot of people notice this game is because it has like a um, 
interesting implementation for uh, how lighting works. Um, in addition to lighting, there is also a kind of like a fog. I'm not sure if you can see it through uh, streaming, but uh, there is more fog at the night and there is less fog uh, during the day. Um, so yeah, this is current uh, status. Maybe there is like something else I didn't mention, but more or less this is uh, what the game looks like now. In terms of like where uh, where I am, um, I'm trying to build. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to get to the first playable build within um, next couple of months, where you will be able to actually build some basic uh, colony. Uh, you can imagine something that um, Dreamworld had back in 2014 or 2015 when it just came. When you have like maybe a couple of dozens of objects you can build and maybe like a few interactions for NPCs, like they can harvest resources, they can protect colony and then maybe hunt and follow you to like, you know, do some raids. Um, and once this is ready, I will um, release this game on Discord for the group of people who left feedback in that form that I posted maybe like a month ago. And I want to like make sure that there is a core game loop that's working, like it's interesting to play the game at least for 30-40 minutes. And if I get good signal, I will continue in the same direction. If this in, or if the signal won't be um, clear, if there will be like something that's missing, I will get back to uh, prototyping stage. But more or less, this is how it works. Um, and I guess um, thanks again. Um, <laughs> so I guess for now I can uh, answer some questions and then I can go into like details about how everything is implemented. And I want to talk about terrain, um, like animation, graphics, characters, and uh, maybe lighting. I was trying to set up NVIDIA Insight to show you like a, a frame debugger to see like all these targets, how, you know, what exactly is happening on GPU. But unfortunately I couldn't figure out how to set it up before the stream. I personally work much more on Mac and uh, with uh, Xcode shader profile, it's a lot easier to set up. So I'm not like really experienced with uh, NVIDIA Insight. Maybe in the next stream I can focus more on graphics internals and today I can only uh, give like a very high level brief uh, over overlook over the shaders and uh, just overall pipeline. Okay, so tr stream on Twitch lagging very hard. There's a big delay. Uh, let me see if I can just tweak something maybe here real quick, and maybe it's gonna work. Um, um, maybe I can switch this to faster, lower quality. Stopping stream. Start the stream again. Hopefully this is this is gonna work. Um, on my machine, everything looks kind of smooth. So maybe it's something else uh, related to maybe my my internet connection or something. Uh, who else is also watching a stream? Can you please uh, leave a message? How how does it work? Okay, interesting. Um, let me see. Sorry for small technical delay. Um, offline, interesting. Um, let's see, start streaming. 
Let me just double check that it works. <clears throat> It's definitely lagging. Um, I don't know if I can fix this now. Maybe you, if you're watching me on Twitch, you can try to switch to a Discord, but I'm also gonna be mostly showing code now. So maybe lagging is not actually that big a problem. So sorry for that. I, I guess next time I will try to debug it a little bit more on Twitch uh, before I go live. Um, Alright, let's do uh, let's do one by one uh, questions and then um, I will go into I will based on that I will either show code Um, okay, cool. So the at least Discord works good. Um, um, also, how many people here? Five people on Twitch. Um, if you're on Twitch, you can also ask questions in, in the chat that we'll be checking this as well. Um, cool. So the first question. Uh, so the chunk generation also is noise altitude map breaking the chunk into zones another noise altitude map spawning zone specific elements and assuming you hard coded uh this chunk to have the campfire yeah so let me actually show you how it works overall um i would say my the code for the game isn't amazing so you will see a lot of kind, kind of stuff that clearly went through a lot of uh, iterations and i didn't refactor everything uh, but at least I'm trying to keep everything really simple, so it's easy to understand after a few months of work what what I was working on and where it was left, and I can easily go back. So the way uh, map generation works, um, and I can show you um, live how how it's generated. Um, I have this crate called MapGen, and it's uh, um, it's like algorithm plus a utility to run it, where you tell um, the size of the chunk you want to generate and uh, a seed number so we can try to regenerate another one later to later in the stream um the way it works um, um so i have like a configs for different layers where i can say what's the um sorry what's the what's the type of the layer and what's the minimum height and maximum height and um, the next thing I have is a bunch of like uh, noise maps for different things. This is just um, uh, what it's called um, pearly noise with different like resolutions and seeds. As you see, it's every, everything is extremely hard coded. And then um, the last thing I have a bunch of uh, poison distributions for uh, different things I want to place. And then I have like this thing called scatter tool where I'm telling like, hey, I want to place uh, this asset on this layer uh, using this noise map. And then it will kind of like try to balance between poison distribution and the noise map. And then it will try to place everything at least that much away from each other. And this is how many things it may place per tile. And then the, the algorithm just going through each tile and trying to apply these rules to decide where to place uh, a bunny. And the same thing for everything else. You can say, hey, I want to place wolves at least 400 uh, units away from bunnies and things like that. And pretty much the same thing I have for trees, um, telling where to spawn them and all the settings. And this is what generates this um, this map right now. There are other rules you can you can make it more and more sophisticated. This is something I built like with maybe like a week of iterations and I was posting all the progress and I I'm mostly kind of happy with how it works, but I think I it it lacks kind of uh variation for um I don't know, like different locations. Like you would like to see something like a small lake and it's populated slightly different or you want to see like a more much denser forest somewhere 
So uh, I think it's a good start, but like this will extend dramatically. And the second part, or I guess third part of this is dungeons. Um, I was experimenting with different algorithms for dungeons and I came up with something ext extremely simple. So first thing we do, we just uh, look at the uh, altitude and everything that's above something is considered a dungeon. Uh, then we populate everything with a rock tile and um, after we split it into kind of rooms of uh, random size and the rooms shouldn't overlap. And then we just, very simple, um, we, we just pick a random um, point in the room and then we do random walk and this is what generates this cave. So it's very simple random walk for some number of steps. Um, not the nicest case, but again, probably good enough to start. Uh, what it doesn't do yet, it doesn't generate um, roofs, so the the cave has basically um, a, uh, a skylight inside. This is something the previous version of the game had, and this one, in this version, I didn't update um, the terrain and all this kind of stuff to support roofs yet. And uh, essentially, if I run this utility, it will generate the map, save it to um, save it to this file, and then my main game will load it. So if I try to um, run it right now, I don't know how long it's gonna take, but let's try a map. Um, also, let me make everything bigger. And let's try um, different seed, um, and once this is done, so like it's doing something with cargo. Okay, once once this is done, the map will be reloaded. Actually, let me try to close it for now. Oh, well, wow. something is really using a lot of CPU on my machine. Um, okay, I'm, I probably can answer the next question. Um, Okay, I know you mentioned last night during the test stream that um, you were seeing slowest maybe because of high how some items has light source. Is there a limit on number of light sources the user can create? Um, for now, there is no limit. Um, the only two things where we're limiting it is that we only rendering the light, which is like some number of units away from player, so it doesn't matter how many lights you have on the map, as long as they're not around the player, uh, the renderer doesn't care about them. Um, and uh, the next thing is like in the light, uh, when we when we sum all the you know light values in the shader, once we have above one or something like that, once we have above threshold, um, the summation stops essentially once you go once your light is very bright then you you can skip all the other light sources but that's all um i don't do any other optimization but i guess it kind of works now i tried it on uh different hardware it works on everything starting with uh 9080 which is pretty old almost like 10 years old gpu um but again before the game will be released. There's a lot of stuff I would like to, um, I would like to make better. Um, all right, so it looks like I compiled the map and see I reran it with different seed and I generated a slightly different map. The only things that hard coded are all this stuff um, at the spawn location, and I will show you in in a second how this part works. Um, so in terms of like how game work in general, um, it's a little bit convoluted because I went through a lot of stages of designing uh, or figuring out what's what's a good approach to build it. But essentially, there are three sources of where, how map is loaded. First one is what I showed you. It's a map generator that produces something like this. It's pretty simple. It's a map uh, with. Um, where it says what's the size of the chunk, and it has all the chunks and all the um, all the information about other things in the map. The chunk is pretty simple. 
um, essentially just a bunch of lists. Oh, sorry, there, there's like a bunch of integer grids for terrain, uh, some details, like you can see like vegetation and other stuff, floors and walls. Or walls could be like also those rocks and things that build, player builds. And there are three lists of structures, items, and creatures, and that kind of describes everything right now. Uh, in the future, of course, there will be more things. There will be like a maybe like some locations where monsters spawn or maybe like other things, but for now it's pretty simple. So that's what uh, Map Generator produces, and it saves it in um, as an asset somewhere here. The second part, uh, what also describes the map is uh, LDTK, and I'm sure some of you know about this program. It's uh, it's an open source map editor um, built by a guy who made um, Tile is not totally. Oh yeah, Tile is a competitor. Yeah, that's correct. But this one, I think it's slightly different. I haven't used Tile that much, but I remember there was something different between them. Um, though the difference is not huge. Like you can use one or another. I also, I'm also not using it um, to generate levels. I'm mostly using it to prepare. Yeah, so the LDTK is created by the guy who made Dead Cells. Um, so um, the way I use it is for two things, mostly for uh, assets generation. So I have two layers, or three layers, I guess. One is like sprites, um, and the other one is uh, rules. So the sprites are just a um, bunch of things where... Um, I'm just telling something like, hey, this is my tile set, and this is the sprite, um, this is the sprite, and this is the name of the sprite. And um, I'm basically just authoring this um, things in the in, in, in uh, LDTK. And you can put whatever you want here. You can put all of your, um, as many um, arguments as you, uh, or parameters as you want. So you can have like something animated. You can imagine like if I want to, let's say if these trees were animated, I could say something, hey, it has, it has actually three columns and one row. And then the game will interpret as animation or something like that. Um, and the second part, the second thing where I'm using it is also for authoring uh, this uh, rules for how to build, uh, how to build walls. So there are generally like two types of uh, t uh, of auto tiling rules commonly used in the games. One of them is usually called like blob rules, and they're used for something like walls. And they look like um, they look like this. Like you need to provide this kind of tile set for all the types of uh, transitions. And then there is like a very simple rule that you can use to figure out which of the tile sprite to use for which situation. Um, I drove them myself, but they're based on some of the assets I built, uh, I, I bought on, on each. Um, and they're not complete. You can see some of these transitions, they aren't really finished just because I, I haven't finished them yet. But there are two things, there are rocks and there are walls. And this one I actually just drove yesterday before the stream. It wasn't there uh, in the test stream. Uh, also, it, it's not it's not finished, but it kind of shows the idea how it works. The second type of uh, rules is called Wong tiles, and they use another program for making them. It's called uh, Tile Setter. I don't know who this guy who made it. I didn't find any other programs that he or any any games that he released, but he looks like somebody who definitely uh, been in the game industry for a long time. So the way it works, you give it um, primary tiles that. Uh, contains just one type of uh, surface and then it will generate you all the transitions between all the surfaces sometimes it doesn't work great but this is very strange kind of surface you're probably not going to ever see this in the game it's not like natural for terrain to have this kind of transition it's like when each of the sides is a different tile and um, it, it, you're probably never going to see this in the real game but other than that it can mix all this uh, primary tiles and generate you something like this and it saves a tons of time i would never be able to draw all these transitions for surfaces and you can also try how it works uh if you pick um i guess if you pick some surface here you can you have kind of like a brush and 
Or maybe I'm doing something weird. Let me try. Maybe it's a weird. Maybe that's not how you use it. Um, let's see. So I need this guy, I guess. Nope. Oh yeah, I guess I need. Yeah. So you you kind of like you can draw it, and it will show you the result. And you can tweak all these rules, how all these transitions work. You can tell exactly how much cutoff you want to have. So this is amazing. This saved a ton of time when I generated that map. This thing I'll put to this, this texture. And the only problem is like tile setter is only integrated with popular um, popular engines, and they don't support. And they don't really have good format for. Um, anything else. So the output in Unity or Godot format, but if you're not on those engines, they don't give you anything to work with Bevy out of the box. And the JSON format the output is not usable for uh, when you have more than two surfaces. So the way this works in my game is actually super hacky. I, um, I have this thing called uh, one decoder where you have to tell what are your primaries in my case the primaries are um, this this and this and uh, also this guy and this guy and then my decoder will go and try to figure out hey giving this to um, given let's say these two primaries this guy looks like these three quadrants are from dark grass and this one quadrant is from uh, bright grass so this is probably uh, a tile for for mixing these two grasses so I'm basically going through the image and I'm trying to do some matching on in the in the image to figure out how to um, how to build like basically to recover all these rules that tile setter should generate, but it didn't generate it. It just generated me a texture, but, and, but it didn't tell me what exactly this texture contains. So it's a little bit annoying. This is why you have a, a very small delay when the game starts, is because it tries to um, process that PNG. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm doing. I'm parsing. Um, I can show you the code. Uh, I'm just telling... I'm getting that JSON file that it outputs just to see which are primaries, and then I'm getting the image and then an extra image for um, different variations of the grass, or sorry, diff other different variations. And then it builds um, something that Bevy can understand. So here you see, so this is what was output by, generated by tile setter up, up until here. And here we have also other random variations of grass, water, and others. That's what the algorithm also builds. Um, so yeah, it goes through all the primaries, it tries to generate average color, and then it goes through all the others and tries to match, tries to get the color of the quadrant, and based on that, tries to match the closest um, color, and then generates uh, what's called the role in the Wong tile set. If you read it, it's like very well explained what what the role is, and then based on this, it creates this mapping from the role to the closest. Um, primary and so on and so forth it's um it's actually not that complicated you just need, essentially just tries to get the average color and get the closest um to that average and that's how this is how we generate terrain it um looks like a lot of work but it actually was relatively simple it took like maybe a day to code um like i said it's very simple al algorithms for all, all of this and this is how we get um terrain so all this um, surfaces all this like rocks yeah so for uh, blob tile sets I'm using LDTK and there's like a second decoder which worked with um, LDTK when we create it we need to create it from layer definition which is coming from LDTK rust uh, the layer definition is pretty simple and it has um, I guess some rules somewhere. I forgot. I wrote it like almost like a year ago. But we go through each group. If it's active, then we are extracting the pattern, and then we create uh, create a rule or pattern from that, and then we save all of them, 
and then we want when we want to produce a tile for uh, some coordinate we take that uh, inte uh, integer map and we generate pattern which is like three by three matrix and then we just try to figure out what's the closest uh, match and then we return it because sometimes you don't get exactly uh, the rule that you're looking for so we need to find the closest one uh, again works pretty simple um, yeah I, I agree LDK was always really easy to integrate with um, I use it in the past to generate the map itself, but then I moved to uh, auto generate map and I, I still keep it for um, tile generation, so for rules generation and sprites. The way um, rules work, uh, let me show you. It's also really simple. Like you can, for example, open this thing and essentially here you have something like a configuration that looks exactly what I was showing you. And you just need to click here and then click on something in your tile set and it will automatically create all this like patterns and rules based on the integer values in your grid so for me it's like two one and three but then you can ext you, you can keep extending it and you keep adding more rules for the new tile sets and then you can also try how it works um and then if you're if you if you match the algorithm they use you will basically get the same result and to render all of that we um we use a crate that you probably all know called ecs tile map um again ecs ECS tile map is pretty simple thing it's just um well i guess pretty simple to use i haven't looked that much into the uh renderer but i think it's more or less classic way of rendering tile maps it's just a it's uh a grid of indices and then a texture and it does sample it and samples from the texture based on location and the index yeah exactly it's mainly used for um manual rules um ma manual maps but uh it's still really handy even just for rules so um yeah so the way we you the way we generate terrain we um we get that map, we get all the decoders, and then we just um, go through the chunk, and then we generate two tile maps, one for walls and one for um, terrain, I guess, yeah, terrain. Um, and then we use that those two decoders to get all the indices for, uh, L, uh, for um, for the ECS style map, the index and the, where we put this index is uh, here. So for walls, it should be blob decoder, and for terrain, it's, it's a Wong decoder. Where is it? Um, anyway, somewhere here. Um, cool. So that's a uh, terrain. I guess the next thing is um, probably worth talking about this animation um, so the way animation works is uh, it's all based on um, a sprite if I go to creatures and let's say open something like uh, Elmer Elmer is my dog so I this, this was the first creature I added so we have um, a bunch of layers uh, default one is kind of like a buddy and then we have two type of tags one tells us the side of this um, sprite and the other one tells um, type of animation and then we also have like other other um, what is called uh, tags to 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 kind of not, uh, annotate where we want to spawn some events so for walk we will spawn we want to spawn like a footstep event and we create like another tag for a more complicated uh, creature like a human for example this looks a little bit more um, complicated, but it's basically the same thing. There's just a lot more animations for like different types of walk, uh, different types of like combat, um, and there is a lot more notifications for footsteps and also for um, for 
for attack there is like a notification to say when when to actually spawn uh, a, a hitbox and uh, since human is kind of complicated it has more uh, layers where you can you know try different types of armor try different types of like uh, helm helmets shields and stuff like that um, this thing is drawn by another guy who's ac actually an artist um, and he's working on um, character animations for the game um, and then the way we use it is um, a little bit complicated um, I guess this is kind of like a next part where the map gets data is this uh, metadata uh, file and I, I made a kind of mistake I put all the assets or sorry, all the prefabs in one file and it became really large so this is like a registry which tells all the configurations for all the um, all the buildings, all the creatures, all the items. Um, so if map has just you know pointers or like IDs for you know what to spawn where, this thing has actual configs for um, uh, prefabs. Usually you will have like one file per thing, but when you're experimenting a lot, I thought it's good. It's going to be handy to put everything in one file. That way, I can like easily, you know, rename something or refactor, or like search and replace. Um, but I can tell this was a mistake because uh, now this file is like really, really large, mainly because of uh, particle configs. Um, but yeah, so here I have um, uh, creatures. Where is it? Uh, so yeah, so let, let's say we have a, this guy. So uh, the way config for creatures looks like has like some label. It has a path where to load tiles from, and for Asprite, it's going to use special. It it's just going to parse all these frames and layers from from the file directly. And then it has all the other things, like what's the size of the occluder, what's the size of the collider, uh, where to place animation, sprite, what's the uh, other things, and um, how like should it be spawned with some inventory or not. So then the loader, when it sees this path, it will, it will load as sprite asset as a dependency, and the way this asset looks like is, and this is like horribly structured because it was moving from one play part to another, uh, from one part of the game uh, of the source tree to another, but it should be in animation. And where we have this thing called, uh, yeah, they have the whole stack, uh, the Deep Knight, they, they, made, they made the whole stack for games. They made their own la language, they made IDE, database like they have a lot of cool stuff um, it's not surprising that this technology that they made by very few people um, it has more um, more like financially successful games than Godot which is kind of funny because there are only few people working on LDTK heaps uh, castle DB but there are a few games that made like almost like a hundred millions um, so the main goal of the game is similar to uh, games like Valheim, Terraria, RimWorld. You um, you have a character. You you can explore the map. You can collect resources. Um, uh, you can like improve your skills and fight with monsters, explore like caves and stuff like that. But you also can build the colony, where you and other NPCs are gonna live, and in that. That part of the game should be similar to RimWorld, except you can't uh, control your NPCs. You can only tell them, hey, you're going to be a woodcutter, or you're going to be a hunter, or a hero. And um, your goal is to survive, because every night you're going to have like uh, a wave of monsters attacking your colony. So you survive, you expand your colony, you, pro you do some progress on like research and, you know, like building new technologies and then you um, as once you gain enough power you can attack a boss on this island 
and uh, defeat it and travel to the next island. So essentially your your goal is to free your land from the monsters or like a, some enemy faction. So that's the goal of the game. It's more or less similar with um, how it is with other survival games. Like there's like no really a, a story. The story is most like a background. Um, but yeah, you, sh you you must be spending time building bases and exploring the map, and the rest is kind of like just to entertain uh, the player. Um, sorry, what what I was showing? Oh yeah, animation format. So um, yeah, so animation format is pretty simple. Um, after we parsed uh, a sprite, we uh, extracted all those. Um, all those layers and all those frames and we parsed which sequence of the frames is for what animation and then we have kind of like um, this we produce this file or sorry this thing where we have atlas with all the all the animations we have um, a list of like you know frame by layer so you can um, say give me a frame for layer armor and uh, number three, so fr frame layer key is uh, action, direction, and index. So you can say, give me something for attack, uh, this direction, and uh, in, uh, frame number three. And we have like a very simple system that just um, that just goes through um, all this uh, animators, uh, where it will try to. Uh, update all the timers in advance to the next fra frame once the uh, timer for the current frame expired and it's it's pretty simple it's basically just incrementing frames on timer there's like some logic with like uh, certain things and there's like a, some logic when we encounter a frame with a notification we either spawn attack or we spawn something else um, but that's basically it. And there's like two other systems that based on your speed or some override, it will uh, tell if we are currently, what like state we're in. Are we walking? Are we playing attack animation? Or, or are we playing um, some other animation? So these systems are com completely disconnected. And there's another one that are setting modifiers, for example, you can play attack animation, but somebody interrupted you, like attacked you first. So we we reset. We can reset. We can reset. We can change the speed, um, and something else. There's also some hard coded stuff that I put like in the last minute just to make something work. And I guess this one is also refreshing layers. So every time you um, pick up something to your um, player or other NPC, this is how we decide which. Um, layer to enable and which layer to disable. Um, sorry, what's the question? All right, so two questions. First one, oh, sorry, I I hope I answered the question about the goal in the game. Let me know if, if uh, I should explain more some of the details. Uh, regarding the, does magic include, does the game include magic? So there won't be magic in the game uh, as like classic um, fantasy magic like the, you won't be able to be a mage you won't be able to learn any um, any kind of spells and anything like that but there will be magic items like you can probably imagine a typical Scandinavian lore where there's like a you know some weapon made by gods or some kind of like mythic materials that you can use to make your weapon stronger but you won't be able to cast any spells i guess in that way it's similar to valheim so there will be something mythical but um there won't be a mage class at least for now maybe there will be later some expansion but i'm not trying to add magic in the game uh to the game right now not even like considering it for this moment for, at this moment uh i feel trying game logic uh, to animation, like trying the attack frame with some damage moment is risky for game predictability and multiplayer support. Decoupling game logic and render logic is harder to... Yeah, I... Uh, 
I agree. Uh, this might be a foot gun if if I will try to do multiplayer. For now, my kind of like approach, since I'm not really a game developer, I I don't really have experience. I'm trying to keep things very simple and get you know cut every corner just to get to the result um, in the medium term. It's not like I'm trying to like completely not have any structure and, and logic uh, in, the, in the game, but I'm trying not to overthink it too much for now. And once I learn, I go back and re-implement stuff. So for example, AI took me like three iterations, terrain took me like two iterations. The first version of terrain was just spawning sprites and it was very jittery, very slow, um, but now it got a lot better. You know, once you get a little bit more experience, you can go back and redo stuff. So maybe I will do something like that with animation. The animation also was, this is the second iteration of animation. The previous one didn't really have the structure, but I found it pretty simple, though uh, maybe like spawning, um, spawning this event, maybe not a good idea. Like if they like attack, like you said, if it's a game, gameplay related, um, maybe it should be decoupled from frame time. We'll see. Maybe it's not that difficult to fix. Um, how save system works in a couple of words. Well, uh, <laughs> the simple answer is there is no save system. Like every time I restart, it, it, um, it refreshes the state of the game. But the, the system I have is in mind is very similar to uh, the map structure that I was showing. Um, essentially, this is just um, it's a list of things with coordinates like you just want to say where are you placing something uh, and what is the thing you're placing and maybe like have some overrides for default parameters or maybe not maybe you just dump everything um, so that's kind of like a plan I have in mind before I may make a first playable build but um, as of now there's no uh, there's no um, save system yet um, the more complicated thing will be when uh, the open world map will work. Um, unlike in Valheim, where you have like one character, um, which is controlled by player or multiple play characters controlled by player, um, you only need to keep like in memory chunks around that player or set of players. In this game, since you have both a player and the colony with NPCs who needs to do something based on real map geometry, real placement of things, obstacles, enemies. Um, I guess you just need to keep both of them in memory. So that's a little bit harder to manage. That's why this is the main reason why I didn't try to approach chunks yet until I have AI uh, mostly working because I just don't know exactly how this open world design will work with uh, situation when you have when you have to run gameplay code for both player and NPCs in your colony. How much friction have you encountered from choosing a young game engine like Devi? Have you been um, Devi version updates? So um, I've tried this. This is not, not the first attempt I tried to make this game. This is the third one. Uh, the first one was in 2018. Uh, my friend and I, who is like probably one of the best software engineers I ever worked with. We both tried to use Unity and build um, the same game on Unity in 2018. And um, I liked C Sharp and everything, but uh, we kind of lost interest after one month. Uh, I, I think we got way too much friction with game like that, building it in uh, Unity because uh, there's just not a lot you can reuse. You can get rendering set up really quick and kind of feel very satisfied in the first week, but after that you realize Unity actually not going to give you that much other than rendering. So we gave up after uh, roughly one month. Um, we built terrain, we built some pathfinding, and that's it. It was nice to have editor, but um, it wasn't really big of a deal, for the, again, for this kind of a game to have editor, other than for authoring um, assets. And then I tried to build my own engine uh, when I was learning Rust uh, back in 2019 or something. Um, and I built the renderer much crappier than uh, WGPU and Bevy, and I gave up. I just didn't really have a lot of experience with graphics back then. 
so this is the third attempt and um, I was able to get um, terrain and characters without animation rendered in the first day. Uh, when I didn't know any uh, Bevy before. Uh, I didn't have any experience with Bevy before. The only thing I was watching is uh, that uh, cookbook or cheat book for Bevy and a channel, I think it's called Logic Projects or something. I was just following it and I was able to get everything set, uh, working like relatively quick. Um, and uh, my over impression after roughly a year is that um, Bevy is fantastic. I really like ECS. Uh, it saves a ton of time. I really like Rust. I, I really like that it gives you a really nice type system and error messages. It's it's fantastic to work with. It's very rare when you have something, when it's stuck with something, um, which is kind of like surprising. I thought it's going to be the opposite, given that how immature this engine is. Um, the things I think lacking the most is UI. If Bevy had like nicer UI support and maybe like nicer implementation for uh, 2D sprites. I know they landed a lot of changes in 0.13, um, but uh, sprites are still not super ergonomic. For example, when you get sprite type or sorry, sprite object or sprite component, you can even see what's the size of it. So there's like a lot of things I would change it and it doesn't work with shaders that well. Like I have like, a, like if you look into the plugin for rendering light, it's, it, it's extremely convoluted how this works. Uh, just because there is no way to use sprites with shaders uh, as is in Bevy. Um, other than that, it didn't really cause any other problems. It was like really nice to work with. Like the assets is fantastic, the ECS is fantastic. Um, maybe a couple of other things. Like there are a couple of really nice plugins like um, Rapier, um, Hanabi for particles, and uh, ECS style map, and also the twin. Uh, animation plugin. All these are just really, really nice to work with and really easy to extend. And uh, I don't really use anything else in Bevy. I built um, everything else is built uh, from scratch, but it was really easy to extend. This is like one of the nicest things. With Unity, um, I'm not like I, I, I'm not like a professional developer in Unity. I, I use it for a month or so. But given that it's closed source and it's how large that is, I don't think I would have such an easy time extending uh, the engine as here. Um, yeah, and then in terms of like updates, uh, yeah, they're kind of hurting. Uh, it takes usually like a few days of uh, debugging everything and making sure everything works. I hate migrating from one version to another. Uh, this game runs on 0.11.3 um, and I'm not updating to 0.12. I'm, I'm trying to do it like skip one version and then update to the next one. Um, they did a lot of changes in asset system and they have a lot of code related to assets. That's my kind of main risk. I updated my plugin to 0.12 and it was relatively painless. So maybe it wasn't that, not going to be that big a video to update. Um, but usually, yeah, it, it takes a few full-time days to do update and like in real days when you work on this uh, as a side project it takes maybe like a few weeks so they're not free for sure um, but you know there's there are kind of strategies how you can mitigate it uh, if, you, if you just think of it up front um, about how the day um, sorry how the day cycle is implemented how the ambient light gets darker <coughs> Sure, this is pretty simple. Um, if you go to the plugin that I have on GitHub for lighting, uh, it has this type called Skylight 2D. Sorry, not this one. Um, huh, where is it? it? Should be just called Skylight. Oh yeah, Skylight 2D. So you can basically, so what is Skylight? In like rendering equation, this is basically the default color that you have. Uh, so this color added to every pixel and unless it's covered by a mask, which is uh, usually roofs. In current version of the game, as I mentioned before, there are no roofs. So every pixel gets Skylight. And the only thing I need to do, I need to change the Skylight based on time of the day. So I have like a time of the day 
displayed here. If I press J on my keyboard, you see that I'm advancing hour by hour. And I have a configuration here in that meta JSON, oh sorry, meta run, which tells um, for, let's see, environment. Yeah, so for environment, it tells, um, I have a couple of like a, almost like a key frames for uh, where I set, so at 1 a.m. this is the color of the sky and at like 4 a.m. this is the color of the sky. And then so I, I have all of these configurations and you can have as many of them as you want. And I guess in the future there will be different uh, configurations for different biomes or uh, weather. And then in my environment system, I basically interpolate um, between them. So if I go to um, framework, um, environment, uh, system daytime, um, I'm just essentially interpolating between two closes, like two points. And yeah, that's how it works. Um, really simple. Yeah, so I'm just doing LERP for um, colors of two points. Um, or maybe a question more about rendering. Um, about safe system, real world and don't starve and oxygen not included all saved a lot more stuff than needed, which led to problems, size and performance on bigger maps, colonies, and in the end, serialization of bulk game entities is easy way, but not the most durable one. Bevy will provide efficient save load and functionality at some point. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of games, uh, they probably like m put a lot more stuff into uh, the saves than what's necessary. I think it's also kind of like a result that um, once, you st once you created the save file format, um, you can't really go back. You need to keep it compatible. And I think at some point of the game, you're, you're still experimenting with what should be there and you probably want to keep it more verbose for debugging. Um, and I think probably not everyone goes back and revisit the save format when the game is closer to release. Um, which is kind of a problem with everything in the game dev. Like you, you want to keep your code and formats flexible, um, but then you need, when the game is close to release, you want to trim all the fat, and this is sometimes really expensive to do um, if you haven't planned it up front. Um, cool. Um, if no other questions, I can quickly show how the rendering works, since I think this is one of the most popular things. Um, but this is going to be just part of it. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to go through shaders and maybe show at a high level how they, you know, how things are rendered. But I unfortunately I don't have like a frame debugger working on this machine, so I can't really show you exactly all the textures, all the probe atlases, and all this kind of stuff, which is so. Um, the rendering happening in is essentially the same um, using the same code path as you can see in the open source plugin. The only difference is this is working on older version of Bevy and this is also having a fog which I didn't ever finish for open source. Um, so in Bevy you can create um, <clears throat> subgraph. sub graph. They, they use a render graph approach which, which kind of ex extensible. And also really complicated to get right. Um, but uh, what you can do is um, you can create your plugin, you can set up all your systems, you can initialize all your shaders, and then somewhere you can add a node to your graph uh, and implement what's going on in this node. And um, it's basically like a scheduler for um, scheduler and also a resource tracker. So when Baby will be rendering as a frame, it will be um, kind of going through each node in topological order, track what node which resources have, and try to invoke all your code inside of the node. And this is all CPU driven, as far as, far as I remember. So what we have here is um, our own pipeline that works the following way. I guess I can just show the pipeline first. 
Um, so at the very high level, what we do here, we split the screen into eight by eight probes. You can think of them as essentially like a approximation of, or lower resolution um, irradiance map. Irradiance is like how much light each pixel um, receive. So when we split it into eight by eight, we get, um, we need to do 64 time less work if we get things right. And then the first thing we do, we compute a uh, sign distance field, which is basically just a distance to every, um, to every object. Actually, I think I can sort of show you how this works because I have all these targets in my compositing shader. Uh, sorry, one sec. Uh, if I go to post processing, um, I should have <clears throat> SDF. So maybe I can just sample it. So SDF. Um, let's see. What if I'm going to. Uh, what if I'm just do uh, SDF sample? Yeah, so this is SDF essentially. As you see, um, it's not normalized. Maybe I'm going to divide it by 256. And essentially every pixel here contains a distance to the nearest obstacle. And the way we have obstacles is uh, very simple. Again, I didn't try to optimize anything yet. In, um, in our SDF target, we are just getting a list of, where is it? Um, occluder buffer. And occluder buffer has um, essentially a list of rectangles and the number of them. So we have data where all these rectangles are stored and we have a, somewhere here, uh, we have also a count. And then we go into all of them and we calculating distances and then we merge them using this run merge uh, operator. Uh, and this gives us something like that. As you see, all the occluders in my games are square. Um, that's because I never optimized this code and, you know, writing something like that for just square shapes was the simplest. And that's what we do first. And, uh, I'm just going to comment this out. Oh, I guess I can just go stage by stage and show you how things done. Um, let's do, let's go back. And once we have this, uh, we can, uh, kind of trace light in a game. So the way we trace light, we're using um, uh, what is called ray, ray marching. Ray marching is the algorithm have to find um, is the, is like if you have a point and if you have a ray, the ray marching will tell you if this ray going to intersect anything in your scene and we want to find the first thing that light will intersect. So the way we use it is that we have, let's say, we, we're trying to get the color for this pixel. So we go for, from each, uh, we start with each of the light sources, or visible light sources, and we try to trace them to this pixel, and if we hit something, then this light does not receive any, uh, this pixel does not receive any light. And, we get it, and we're doing this in, uh, in the probe space, so only for uh, 1 64th of the work. So if I try to see how this works, um, I don't think I have probe texture here, um, but maybe I can just show you irradiance texture, and this will be um, kind of good enough, maybe. Uh, irradiance, and let's try this one. Irradiance X Y <coughs> X Y Z, and we don't need to normalize it. Does it work? Nope, it doesn't work. Uh, wonder why? Am I doing something wrong? Oh yeah. Cool. And imagine something like this, but in. Um, 
but in, in, in a lot lower resolution. So that's like a, what probe map will render. It just contains the color for every pixel, um, so for every, for every probe. Uh, traced using that approach. The way it's done is that we, like I said before, um, this is like some setup that is, I will, I guess, explain in a bit. Um, but what we do, um, what we do, we go through every light source, we check the distance. This is ugly and hard coded. I'm just rejecting every light source that like 180 units away. Then I see if it intersected something and then I compute attenuation. Basically, if the, the further my pixel from the light source, the dimmer it will become. And you use uh, the light uh, parameters for the fall off. And then there's like a formula that computes all of this. There's also a fog that take took, took into account that like the more fog density in this pixel, the quicker it loses the energy and stuff like that. And if we um, if we didn't get any intersection, sorry, if we didn't intersect anything, then we just accumulate color uh, with given intensity and uh, given intensity and attenuation. And when we calculate it for that pixel. Uh, we compute the raw, like raw and the column for our probe atlas. Unfortunately, I can't show you how it looks right now. Um, but just imagine that the screen divided by many, many squares, and we only updating one square at a time, which corresponds to that, you know, frame. And uh, so we, we computed the which frame to update, and then we brought to that frame using texture store. And for every frame, we go to the next um, to the next square in that uh, atlas. And again, sorry that I can't really demonstrate it because I didn't have debugger set up. So that way we can store up to 64 frames in our atlas if we use 8x8 um, probe. And the next step for us will be to blend them. So when we blend them, essentially what it... Oh, sorry, no, I'm, I'm wrong. The next step is to bounce. So what bounce does is um, computes secondary light, uh, where it gets bounced light, as the name suggests. The first step only computes direct light from a source of uh, light to some pixel, and then the next step will be also computing how much light we receive from something that is not necessarily a light source. So in the next step, essentially, we treat every other pixel as a light source. Um, here, we kind of cheating a little bit, we essentially what we do, we try to do, do this like exponential sampling. We pick some radius, then we go and sample 64 uh, uh, points around some uh, around some center, and then we increase radius and we we sample more and more, and uh, we we know the distance from them. We can raymarge them, so we do in basically the same thing, but we tracing from. Other we we sampling from other pixels and checking if we if they are visible from this pixel. That's how we compute secondary light. Um, and after that, all we do is we just apply um, temporal um, sampling. We go to the previous eight frames and we do the same thing. And then after that, we blur everything using bilateral filter. Um, and then we just um, combine everything together. So the combining part, part is also kind of funny because we do it layer by layer. And the way this works, um, so for floor, we apply that computed light as is. So what you see here, like for every pixel on the floor, uh, we just copy paste light and we add it to the pixel color. For objects, we do it slightly different. So if you can see, uh, if I'm in front of the light, my object is brighter, but if, if I go here, my object is not as bright as in front. The way this is done, we have this, um, we, we kind of like sample neighbors of our pixel if we are inside of the object. Um, and we go into 
Uh, so for x coordinate, we're going to both left and right, but for y coordinate, we're only going down. So if we didn't find anything bright here, if we didn't find any like bright pixel, then we don't really add anything to the object. But if I go here and we kind of sample down, we found bright pixels, they will contribute to the object. So this is a very simple trick, and this is how it's getting this almost like a 3D look sometimes. Uh, without any um, actual 3D rendering or anything like that. So that's like this is the only trick. And then we combine all this together and we also um, combine like noises in some way. I, I need to look into this one more time to figure out how we combine noises. Uh, but that's basically it at the high level. I think it's going to be a lot easier to explain with uh, actual images of the targets. Um, cool, so um, I think it's been like an hour and a half. Uh, I was only planning the stream for one hour, but um, it was kind of cool to explain how everything works. I wonder if anyone has any other questions. Maybe I have like a time for one or two questions, and if, um, if nobody has questions, then we can wrap up. Cool. So the next, uh, I guess the next stream, uh, I don't have a di date in mind. I will just try to prepare um, um, debugger. Maybe I will run, uh, maybe I will stream from my Mac, just the debugger code, and it will be a lot easier to explain when you see all these pipelines and targets in the frame debugger. Cool. Um, all right. Thanks, everyone who joined. I hope this was uh, useful. And uh, see you next time.